Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this message. We thank you for the, the call that this church has to, to help support missionaries. And we thank you also, it's to feed uh, us the word of God so we can reach our community. And so some of our missions fields are across the street, down the hall, next door, on the other side of town. Our coworkers, our teammates, our family, that, that's our mission field. And we thank you, Lord God, that we can come to church, get equipped so we can reach others for you. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So today we're starting a series called Believe. Just one word, simple as that, believe. And so we're going to be talking about various topics throughout the Bible where we are challenged to believe, where we're challenged to, to say, okay, this is what God's word says. I'm going to ride with it. I'm going to roll with it. I'm going to apply it to my life. I'm going to partake of that. I'm going to use it. I'm going to make it part of my daily routine. And so today we're talking about doubt. And to be corny, it's what about doubt, right? You know, we're going to talk about that. Or Faith Chapel, what's the opposite of faith? Doubt, right? So we're going to look at that today. Today we're, we're going to be answering, over the next few weeks, we're going to be answering and overcome doubts, fears, questions. And we're going to talk today about one guy in the Bible that's rarely talked about. And so we're going to do a little Bible quiz, like we're in children's church. I'm going to say the first part, his first name, and you're going to tell me his last name, right? Okay? So his first name is Doubting. His last name is Thomas. I thought that was kind of funny. First name is Doubting. What's your name, Doubting? Oh, no, it's Thomas, right? But everyone knows him as Doubting Thomas. And I, he kind of gets a raw deal. Like there's 12 verses in the Bible that talk about him, and he's known as Doubting Thomas. But we're going to go from Doubting Thomas to Believing Thomas, okay? And in our lives today, I don't want you to become Doubting Brian or Doubting Becky or Doubting Moss. I want you to just go straight to Believing, okay? And we're going to don't stop believing. We're not going to sing it, Ben. Calm down. Just take a break. All right. All right. But we're going to talk about that. So what I like about Thomas is he shows us evidence that even the biggest doubters can have faith, could have strong faith. Even the people's like, oh, I can never believe that. I would never do that. They could have faith. And so there's different types of people. There's people that is the Bible says it. I believe it. That settles it. You can't talk them off that. That's, that's the way they are. Right. I know that when someone says Pittsburgh Steelers, I believe that they're a not very good football team. Right? Just saying. You can't talk me off that ledge. That's it. That's who I am. That's gospel truth. Take it to the bank. Anyway. Some are like, I want to believe, but I'm a little more skeptical. And that's Cleveland Browns fans. I hope, I hope, I hope we win, but it's never happened before in the history of mankind. So it might not happen this year. Does that make sense? I know I'm using sports. Some people are like, what do you mean sports? Um, there's a reason why they call Cleveland football the mistake on the lake. <laughs> Just saying right now. Because like, we're like really excited because football starts next Sunday. We're going to win. We're going to win. And it doesn't happen. Or something happens and they beat themselves up. So then there's the I'm Atlanta. The I'm Atlanta what does that say? Analytical. And I want to believe, but we need to answer some questions first. Right? There's those type of people. And there's the people that, what if this entire thing of God I serve and he's not even real? What is that all about? And so there's doubters everywhere, right? There's doubters everywhere. We're all on different levels, and that's the way life is. And so we're never going to look down at someone because they don't believe like we do. If we're the I, if we're the I said it or the Bible said it, I believe it, that settles it. We don't look down at somebody else who needs evidence. We don't look down on them. We say, okay, hey, how can we get that? The Bible says when a person has encountered Jesus, he goes, I believe, but help my doubting mind. Help me out up here. I'm having a hard time up here. I believe what you said is true, but I'm having a hard time in my head comprehending it. So we're going to follow and we're going to look and we're going to get to that point because doubts comes in all shapes and sizes. Webster's Dictionary defines it as to be uncertain and undecided about, to distrust or disbelieve or suspicion. Okay, different types of doubters. There's those who doubt the very existence of God. There's those who doubt God's involvement. Yeah, there might be a God. He might be there, but that's only for the people on this side of the church. Uh, he wouldn't, I sit over here all the time. So no, it's only for other people. They don't, they don't believe that God would want to work in their lives. And we know through the Bible that God does. And there's those who doubt their lovability, 
man, I believe in God, but I've done all this in the past, right? I've done all this. I, I, you know what, man, when I was younger, I cheated on tests, so God's not going to love me. When I, when I was younger, I did this. I actually said no to my parents. God can't love me, right? I've done all this stuff. God can't love me. And we, we get into some thicker and deeper things that we really down deep believe God can't love me. But we know that the Bible says that God does. And he takes whatever we've done and he forgets about it when we ask for forgiveness. And then there's those who doubt Christians. I'd love to go to church. I'd love to follow God. But that person goes to church and I don't think they follow God. Like, so people are thinking like, man, and I know a guy uh, who he doesn't like going to church because, you know, he sees people that don't act like Christians. And I'm like, hey, are we following people or are we following Jesus? Because if you follow me on the highway, I guarantee you I'm breaking the law. I'm trying not, I, I mean, I paid for the whole speedometer. I'm using it all. Does that make sense? I was taking a, a, um, someone home and they're like, how fast does this thing go? I said, it goes as fast as I want it to go. Like, I try, I'm trying. But you know what? When I'm driving down the highway, there's still people passing me. And I'm like, you know what? I'm not that bad. I could be a sinner like them, you know. You get what I'm saying? We all have our faults, and that's my only one. You laugh at that joke. Oh, fine. But (laughs) doubt, listen, doubt is the beginning of real, sincere faith. If you doubt, that's the beginning, not the end. Because what that doubt does is now that doubt's like, all right, I'm going to look in the Bible and prove myself wrong. I'm going to look in the Bible and say, you know what? I can grow. Doubt is not the end. For many people, it's the beginning. Because we must swim through the river of doubt to the shore and find out what's solid. If we took you and we just, let's go on a boat. Oh, Brian has a boat. So let's all take a church family trip on his boat at the same time. Right? So we're all on his boat. Or we could take turns. And we're like, all right. We're going to go, can we water ski on your boat? Is it, is it water skiable? Yes. Yes. So, and the, the rope snaps, right? He just guns it zero to 60 in a second. Boom, boom. The rope snaps, and you're floating down the river, the mighty Mississippi River, right? What do you do? Oh, I'll just go downstream, just hang out here. No, if you're anything like my wife, see... There was a time we were on jet skis. This is my first time on a jet ski, and I'm, I'm the driver. Becky's behind, and she's holding on tight. And first thing I ever did on a jet ski, because I've never been on a jet ski before, is I gunned it, boom, straight line. And I'm heading against the current. So it was boom, 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 boom. And I'm like, oh, I wonder what happens if I turn left. And I turned left, and physics took over. And Becky went flying off, and she held on to me, and we went flying off. And then I'm like, okay, we swim back to the stability of the jet ski, but not Becky. She decides she needs to get on first. She pushes my head under, climbs up on this jet ski, and she's like, don't you ever do that to me again. And I was like, what did I do wrong? I thought that was awesome. When we're floating down the river of doubt in life, if we're in darkness, we need to get to something solid to survive. If we were in the river, we kept going downstream, eventually you're going to run into a lock and dam. Not fun. So you have to get to something solid in order to survive. We must wade through the river of doubt and come to the shore of faith and our beliefs. We all have to do that. There's no shortcuts. So doubt is the beginning of faith. If you turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 24 and John chapter 20, uh, or on your devices, your paper Bible, your electronic Bible, or we have the big giant Bible up on the wall here. And if we look at Luke chapter 4, we're going to see where this all starts with, doubting Tom, or with Thomas. We won't call him doubting anymore because he doesn't doubt. The Thomas who formerly doubted, I don't know. But in verse 36 of Luke chapter 24, it's up on the screen there. It says, while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and, and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. Why? Because they were all in a room and the doors were shut. The doors didn't open and Jesus was right there. Would that freak you out? Remember when they were on the boat 
They thought they saw a ghost. Jesus is walking through the storms of life, right? Or just not storms of life. He's walking through the storms. That also kind of represented when we're, when we're going through the storms of life, Jesus comes walking in to rescue us. That's another sermon for another time. But, but, but forget this. Many of them saw Jesus die on the cross, dead, dead, dead. Not Princess Bride, possibly dead, but dead, dead, right? And all of a sudden he shows up in the room. Now, my stepdad passed away 24 or some years ago. If he showed up at lunch, I would pee my pants. Just saying. Like, that had to freak him out. And so Jesus was dead, and then they see him. That is amazing right there. That will erase doubts immediately. So it goes on in verse 38. He said to them, why are you troubled? Uh, well, <laughs> You just appeared into the room and we thought you were dead. Anyway, he goes, why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and feet as it is myself. Touch me and see me. Now, I think Jesus might have had a little bit of a sense of humor at this point. He might have said, look at my hands and feet as he's looking at him through the holes in his hands. A little dramatic, right? He might have done that. He might not. Look at my hands. When he said this, he showed them their hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it was because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, which ended up being Swedish fish. And he took it and ate it in their presence. Guess who wasn't there? Thomas. Thomas wasn't there. So now we go to John chapter 20, verse 24. It says, now Thomas, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. It, we could say that Thomas missed church. Maybe there was something going on. Maybe he had to do something at home, but he missed out. He missed out on Jesus showing up. He missed out on the, the presence of God, relieving doubts, relieving fears, relieving everything that he was going through. He missed out on the peace be still moments of Jesus showing up in church. And we miss out on this. Sometimes we can, you know, we can get a false image of who God is. We can get, we can get a God's out to get us mentality because we miss church. We shouldn't have that. So when we're going through tough times, we need to make sure we're going or staying in church. For example, my wife and I have been married for 24 years. Yes, 24 years. 25 coming up, so I need to think of something nice to do for our anniversary. If you have any ideas, let me know. Uh, 25 years, what would our relationship be like if we were just like a, a every Sunday type thing? Like we just talked every Sunday. But coming up, it's football, so don't talk to me during football. Or talk to her during her naps. Wouldn't have much of a relationship, would we? No. What's crazy, and I'm not trying to, I'm not getting brownie points for me, but my wife knows, we talk, we talk every day. And I, when I leave work, I call her. And one, what was it the other day? I left, or it was, oh, it was a Friday and I wasn't working. So she's like, around 4 o'clock, she needed to have her phone on her. And I didn't call. And so what she do? She pulls up Life360. You wonder where I'm at. She goes, oh, he's at home. No wonder he didn't call. Well, we talk all the time. We have a relationship. It's a growing relationship. And why is that? Because we talk all the time. We need to have that with Jesus. I mean, can you imagine if, like, the only time my wife and I went out to dinner was Christmas and Easter? Right? And I wish I would remember what, what uh, was, anyway, the CEO of the church, the Christmas and Easter or something like that, that someone had said. So anyway, it was a joke. But see, doubt is a byproduct of our neglecting our time with Jesus. Doubt is a byproduct of neglecting our time with Jesus. The more time we spend with Jesus, the less doubt we'll face. When do we begin to question God and the reality of existence when we're not around him? I can't deny the reality of your existence right now. Like I know every single one of you guys exist. Why? Because I can see you. Because I'm close to you. If I wanted to walk over, I can tap each one of you guys on the head and go duck, 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 goose, run around the church. Because we're right there. If we are not around God, then we have the ability to start doubting again. You see, when we do have, when do we have faith and confidence in God? When we're around him, when we're spending time with him, 
but I can't see God. No, but you can see what his words say. You can spend time with him. It's a whole faith thing. You see in our next slide, John chapter 20, verse 25, the other disciples told Thomas, it says, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the holes were and put my hand into his side, I'll not believe. Thomas wanted to see it. He needed to see it. What was Thomas saying? I need to see with my own eyes. I need a firsthand experience. And this brings us to our main point today. That's what we want you to, to, to remember as we walk out of church today is our doubts subside when we have an encounter with Jesus. When we have an encounter with Jesus, our doubts subside. And the, the next point here is secondhand faith will always leave you doubting. Thomas heard Jesus was alive from other people. He hadn't experienced Jesus' resurrection life for himself yet. And so many people, they just kind of believe because their parents believed or they kind of believe because some other people believe. We need to go from kind of believe Christians to believe. We believe something. We believe in God no matter what's going on in our life. Because one day something's going to happen that rocks our world and we're going to say, what do I really believe? And at that point, we all go through that. We must remember, hey, we believe in God. And our firm foundation is God. When our foundation is God, even though the winds and the waves and the storms of life come at us, we're not shaken. We had winds the other day, and uh, this church probably had winds pushing up against it. But it's not moved because it's got a firm foundation. We can go down in the basement and we can see it. It's old foundation. doesn't look nice. But it's a firm foundation. And when our life's foundation is on God, then we start to build on top of it with our faith. Don't wait until something happens to build your faith. Start today. Start right now. You see, it goes on in John chapter 20, our next slide. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came in and stood among them and said, Peace be with you did it again. He's poof, there he is. Then Jesus said to Thomas, put your finger here in my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side, which is kind of weird. And then he goes, stop doubting and believe. Jesus tells that to Thomas. You see, the stone didn't keep Jesus in the tomb and a locked door wouldn't keep him out of the room. Why? Because Jesus, he's Jesus. You so that was them back then. What about us right now? A, a wall we put up in our lives is not going to keep Jesus out. But Jesus is just kind of waiting patiently for us to say, all right, I believe. Jesus isn't like in the busting the door down, boom, FBI, open up. You know, he's not into that. He's waiting patiently. But when we open that door and we let Jesus in, I mean, he does a lot of things. And we're like, man, why didn't I do this before? You see, that's who God is. So he says, notice what he didn't say to Thomas. Jesus appears, and he didn't say, here, Thomas, look, I'm alive, dummy. He didn't go, hey, disgrace to my disciples. I got them all in a row, and you're the last one now on the food chain because you didn't believe, Thomas. He said, your name is now forever doubting, Thomas. No, he didn't say that. He said, don't doubt. He didn't put him down. He didn't zap him with lightning. He didn't say, you can't be my disciple anymore. He said, no, he gave him what he needed. He said, stop doubting and believe. Start over. Jesus didn't look at his doubt. He didn't look at it. He didn't even acknowledge it. He didn't say, believe, but hey, you can't doubt anymore. He said, no believe. Our doubts subside when we have an encounter with Jesus. And this is the Jesus in Psalms that's talking about who God is. And so we're going to break from the Old Testament, go to the uh, New Testament, go to the Old Testament real quick. Psalms 103 verses 2 and 5. If you don't remember any scripture from today, remember this one. If you're taking notes, highlight it. If you're not taking notes, write it on your arm, write it on your neighbor's face so you remember it. It doesn't matter. Psalms 103, 2 through 5. It says, praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. What are his benefits? Well, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases? 
That's two great benefits right there. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Who satisfies your desires with good things so that your, renewth, your youth is renewed like the eagles. One thing I like about this scripture is it tells us some of the benefits and the blessings of God that we don't necessarily remember. So we could say it like this. Praise God, my soul or my mind, and forget not all what God's benefits. God who forgives my sins and heals my diseases. So if I've sinned, poof, God forgives them. If I got a stuffy nose, sickness, if I got anything going on, he heals all the diseases. A lot of diseases are coming back up, right? People are bringing them back up and all this kind of things. Remember, God heals all diseases, all right? Who redeemed my life from the pit and crowned me with love and compassion. Do you have love and compassion? Speak that over your spouse. Hey, God's crowned you with love and compassion. I'm going to say that over my wife all the time because I mess up. I want love and compassion. You don't want angry Becky. Trust me. She turns green. Anyway, it was a Hulk joke. It was funny. The guys in the sound booth got it. God who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like eagles. Anybody have a, you just wake up sore? Or if you stand up out of bed and you stretch, if something pops, you know you're going to have a good day. Okay, good, I'm good. Something. Do the eagles ever go, I'm too tired to fly? Caca, fly, ah. I don't know what a, what does an eagle make? Shriek? I can't remember. <laughs> anyway, so, ah, ah, right? Oh, I'm too tired today. I'm not going to go hunt and eat. No. So our youth can be renewed like eagles. Sorry, was that bad, Brian? Like a, my bad eagle impersonation. But the eagle, he's, he's looking at me like I'm done. Anyway, the eagle never is like I'm sore and tired. So when we say that to ourselves, hey, my youth is renewed like the eagles. I'm not having sore days. I'm not, I'm not getting old. I'm always going to feel young. Think about that. Go back to John chapter 12. That's who God is. So if you're doubting who God is, read that and start building it up in your faith. That's what I wanted to say there. We go back to John chapter 20. Our next slide. Remember, Jesus says, hey, stop doubting and believe. Then Thomas replies to Jesus and says, my Lord, my God. He's like, he's amazed. And then Jesus tells him, because you've seen me, you believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And our last thought that we want to share today is the winner between faith and doubt is determined by which we choose to act on. If you get doubt in your life, you can act on it. If you get faith in your life, you can act on it. Well, I'm going through this situation. Well, let me just ask you this. If you're going through this situation, maybe it's a sickness. Maybe you're feeling down because you've sinned and messed up. Maybe you're going through something physically, spiritually, or emotionally. Find out what the Word says about that situation. Go back to Psalms 103, what we just read. Heals all my diseases. I don't care if you're, you're sitting down at the, the throne in the bathroom, making a deposit. Speak the word out of your mouth. Throwing up. I remember when I was a kid, I'm sorry to be gross, but I remember as a kid, I, I had some place to go, but I was throwing up. And I was like, you know what? God forgives my sins and heals all my diseases as I was dripping. I'm, I'm, I don't care what's going on physically. I'm moving my eyes spiritually. I can, I, can, I can act upon the doubt or I can act upon the faith. The winner's determined by what I act upon. So whatever's going on in our life, find out what the word says. Does it say you can be free from this? Then be free from this. Well, I don't know if that's me. Well, now you're acting on doubt. Well, this is what the word says and I'm gonna believe it. Well, now you're acting upon faith. Well, who wins determines on what we act upon. Our doubts subside when we have an encounter with Jesus. You see, we can believe with our heart and still have doubts in our head. We can. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, it says, listen, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Take the Bible, start reading it. Read Psalms, that Psalms 103 out. Jesus has done it, and he's paid the price with his life for our sins. And with that, 
we get all the benefits of God. Doubts come in all shapes and sizes. Jesus didn't come for perfect people. Oh, if I'm perfect and I do this, then, then I can get, then, that, then Psalms 103 is for me, right? No, it's for everybody. So as we close, listen, Thomas, he was unfairly branded as a doubter, right? We know there was an encounter with Jesus. He's now believing. Listen to what Thomas did. He traveled outside the Roman Empire in 52 AD. Thomas, who doubted Jesus was risen from the dead, traveled farther than any other disciple, going all the way to India to preach the gospel because he believed they needed a relationship with the Christ that had transformed him. This is Thomas. Thomas, uh, he and says, and when they met him early in a cave one morning, he said, Renou- they said, renounce your faith. And, and the enemies of Christ said this. He goes, I'll never renounce my Lord, my God. And, and he, he died believing Jesus was it because they wanted him to renounce Jesus. And he died because of it. Thomas believed in Jesus enough to die for him. Peter, we all know Peter, right? Peter was was the one that was, was so zealous for God, for Jesus, that he was like, Jesus, they come for you. He, grabs, he grabbed the guy's sword and he chopped off another dude's ear. I don't know if he missed, but the ear was gone. He was so adamant. I'll never desert you. I'll never, I'll never turn my back on you. And then remember what Jesus said. He goes, hey, before the rooster crows three times, you'll deny me. Peter's like, nah. And it, that happened. He did deny Jesus. And then Jesus restored him. And the Bible says that he preached his first sermon and 3,000 people got saved. That's 3,000 more than my first sermon. You see, Peter, who believed, doubted, and believed again, they were putting people on the streets as he walked by so his shadow would touch them and they were healed did some crazy things for God. You see, we look at Saul, if you're like, well, I've never really doubted that Jesus and God were real, but I've done some not so nice things. You bring in Saul, who was renamed Paul, hated Christians. To put it in terms today, he would bust through those doors and arrest us all for having church. And even some of them, he was like, well, arresting's not enough. Let's just go ahead and kill him. He was there when they stoned Stephen. All of a sudden had an encounter with God and he was transformed. And we see in the Bible that he's rich, wrote two thirds of the New Testament. We can do great things for God. We can have a successful life pursuing God. Even if we doubt right now, even if we have doubts in the future, as long as we're pushing closer to Jesus, that our doubts subside when we get closer to God, when we have an encounter with Jesus. That's what we have to pursue today. That's why we are real people pursuing a real God. We're constantly pursuing Jesus because it pushes doubts out of the way. Let's pray. God, we thank you for today. God, I thank you for moving in our lives. I thank you that as we get closer to you, Lord God, we can get doubts out we can get closer to you. Maybe it's just starting by reading one scripture a day. That's one more scripture than yesterday or we've done in the past. Maybe we do something and we're just, we're taking baby steps or maybe you're like, you know what? I don't like baby steps. I just, I'm I'm full metal. I'm I'm just put the pedal to the metal, zero to 60 type personality. And, And maybe you read a chapter a day. You see, just get closer and encounter Jesus on your own terms. Don't wait till tomorrow. Start today. But get closer to Jesus because Jesus changes everything. Jesus takes the doubts out when you come to him and say, you know what, I, I believe in you now. I, I, I want to I wanna have that relationship with you. He says, all right. And he moves forward. He doesn't talk about your past. He doesn't talk about what you just did. He just forgives you. And so it's simply saying a prayer, saying, God, forgive me of my sins. Be my Lord and be my Savior. Help me love what you love and help me not do what you've commanded us and asked us not to do. 
Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me and help me get closer to you. Simply by saying that. It's believing in your heart, saying it with your mouth. And so I'm encouraged today that we can get the doubt out and we can just start moving in that relationship with God. We can start getting closer to God. I don't care if you've got just, just started a relationship with God two seconds ago or 20 years ago. God doesn't look at you any different. He just wants that relationship with you. So Father God, I thank you for driving this home. I thank you that this message was from your heart to our hearts and we can apply it to our lives. And we give you all the praise and the glory in Jesus' name, amen. Now, I, it's the first Sunday of the month. We're here with family. So I'd like to participate in communion. You don't have to if you don't want to. Miles, you got that one. Two hands, please. And, and you don't have to just, just pass the, the, the elements. Darren, thank you for taking care of this. I need to grab one for Michaela and myself. Oh, no. All right. Once the elements are passed, we'll all partake together. It's angled. Let's put on the cajon. And... Sorry. Need a table. And I touched a cracker. I'm sorry. If you got your elements, just kind of just reverently close your eyes and put your focus on God for a few minutes here. If you if you don't want to partake, then just sit reverently. It's, it's, it's okay. It's fine. Thank you, Jesus. Maybe you've got, you know what, you say, all right, God, I need to ask you for your forgiveness of this or speak to my life, God. Just help me. I got a situation. I don't know what to deal with. What's, what's pretty interesting is I was as you're sitting there, I'll, I'll, I'll brag on God for a second. I had a, a job at work I was doing, and it had a really, there's a really tight tolerance to it, and it's, it's just, once you get it going, it works just fine, and the, it felt like something was off or whatever, and all of a sudden, it was just like, boom, God just sparked it into my head. It was like, it was like, he spoke, the Holy Spirit's come up, it just come up from the inside, it was like, just, just do this. Will be do this, and it'll be fine. So what did I do? I, I did that, and guess what? It was fine. So maybe today you need God to speak something into your life. You need to say, Hey God, I need help in this situation. I need help in this uh, relationship, or I need help in this um, whatever you need help in. Let God speak it to your life, and then when He speaks it to your life, have the faith to do it. Don't doubt, is that, was that really God? Was that, you know, what was that? No, that was, if it's, if it's life-giving and true, you'll know who it is, it's God. If it's, hey, God, I need money, and you hear, go rob a bank, that's not God. So as we got the elements for communion, Jesus took the bread in the, in the upper room, and he said, this is my body, which was broken for you. Take, eat, and do this in remembrance of me. And so he he broke the bread, and the bread represents the body of Christ that was bruised and beaten for us. And you can really break it down and say that everything we need to live a, a healthy life on this earth was provided through Jesus' body. It, healing, health, not, no anxiety, anything we need in our minds, mental, mental health, that type of stuff was provided when Jesus was bruised and beaten because the Bible says by his stripes you were healed, that his body was bruised and broken for us. And so uh, this is that faith part where you say, all right, God, thank you for by providing for me. Thank you for being bruised and broken and partake of the, the cracker at this time. Thank you for going to the cross for us, Jesus. Then he took the cup and he said, this is my blood which was shed for you. And what that comes down to is, is that the Bible says that, that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. And so because Jesus' blood was shed as a spotless, sinless person, he became the sacrifice that wiped our sins away. And so Jesus, when he goes to the cross, his, his blood became the atonement for our sins. It was the punishment was paid. 
It was paid in full. And so he's saying that, that through, through his blood is the forgiveness of sins. And that helps us live a life spiritually on this earth. The body was physically, this blood was spiritually. And so we can live a, a, a life free from the guilt and condemnation of sin. Say, all right, God, thank you for forgiving me of, of this sin. And, and God forgives us. We don't have that weight to carry on our lives anymore. So God, we thank you for your blood. We thank you that it's for the forgiveness of sins that it represents. And go ahead and drink and partake. And thank you, Jesus, for going to the cross for us. I encourage you to pursue God on a daily basis and watch the results. And trust me, you do that and God will change everything in your life. Will it happen instantaneously? No, God's not a microwave. He's a crock pot. But you'll notice over time. So, God, we thank you for keeping us safe. We thank you for what you've called us to do as a family. We thank you for all the things we've got going on. And I thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.